No matter what your rank or where you're stationed or which service uniform you wear, presenting a good military image is a universal expectation for U.S. servicemen and women. But why is it so important? And when does personal expression, be it by changing your hair color or getting a tattoo, cross the line? Find out in the next half hour as we examine why image matters and what that means to you. For the thousands of military men and women who serve as members of precision drill teams, and other ceremonial units, looking sharp is a way of life. They're the ones most often in the public eye. The ceremony that you are about to witness is the changing of the guard. It's a role that drives a need for attention to every detail. We represent the entire military. It's countless number of hours outside. 24-hour workday, sleepy hours at 2 o'clock in the morning. Things that we do so that we, we can be the best and, and represent the country to, the, to, our, to our best. The metal pieces we actually spin on a jeweler's wheel. Our belts are custom-made. Uh, this is one of the pieces of equipment that we keep on our rack, our equipment that we're wearing for the day. Something that very few people can say they do. To be honored enough to, to be able to be in the public eye, uh, a lot of people when they come and visit the tomb of the Soldier, they're touring D.C., they see all the sites and they come and see the tomb because it's on their tour brochure. Uh, and a lot of people, this is the only piece of military that they actually see. When they come here and they see a soldier in uniform, they look at us representing the rest of the military and they see a direct reflection of what the military is. It's understandable why the spit-shined, sharply creased image the old guard presents to the public is important. But the work most service members do every day happens without an audience. So why should concerns about image matter to them? While the choice of words varied, the answers we got from military men and women around the world all had one ideal in common. When someone does something in a uniform, it's not just a reflection on that person. It's a reflection on every military service. You're representing your country. So due to that, you must have a good representation because it's not only for yourself. Like your appearance is pretty much everything in the military. First, the way you look, the way you act, and everything like that. You know, it starts with the outside looks, and then from then on, it's, you know, courtesies, being professional, being nice to people. So the people that you know, you, you're trained for this, that you're uh, ready to fight, and that you're, uh, uh, you're diligent in what you're doing. It's more than your looks, whether your boots are shine or uniform is pressed. It's about your confidence and your way you present yourself to people. And that's the perception they're going to get off of you, whether we're professional or we don't care about the way we look. We don't care about the way we look. Do we care about the way we perform our jobs? You know, we always take pride in what you do. Appearance plays a big role in how others perceive you. For military men and women, service regulations focus on much more than just wearing a uniform the right way. How you fit in your uniform how you cut your hair, the amount and type of jewelry you can wear. There are specific rules for each. Still, when one of those standards isn't met, it's usually an easy fix. But what happens when a tattoo doesn't meet standards? What are the rules? And are there possible career consequences? With the increased popularity and acceptance of tattoos in American society, more military men and women are seeking answers to those questions than ever before.
Among those who serve in the U.S. military, tattoos are nothing new. In fact, historical records tell us Navy sailors were among the first groups of Americans known to get them. The U.S. Navy, especially in the Pacific, had been there many, many years, and they had taken tattooing from other navies and civilian sailors. Case in point, Chief Petty Officer Frederick Wilson, who served with the Asiatic Squadron from 1899 through 1901 and kept a log describing his travels. Frederick loved getting tattooed. He loved it. He thought it was an art form. He wasn't ashamed about it at all. He, and he loved traveling from port to port, and this was his souvenir that he picked up. He's more vocal about the tattoos and what they mean to the sailors, and it's a competition on board the ships. But the impression that I get is that when you leave the ship, you know, that sort of culture isn't discussed in port towns and church suppers. In 1908, Navy Surgeon Amon Fahrenholt examined the personnel records of nearly 3,600 men who had enlisted or re-enlisted on board the Navy training ship Independence during the preceding eight and a half years. He discovered some 23% of first-time enlistees already had one or more tattoos. As for those who had re-enlisted one or more times, Dr. Fahrenholt learned more than 53% had tattoos. Usually tattooing is when you have large wars and you have large numbers of very young sailors. I wasn't full grown yet. <laughs> that was exactly the story for Lloyd Brown, who was only 16 when he served with the Navy during World War I. USS New Hampshire is what it's supposed to be. It's kind of faded a little bit. <laughs> Lloyd Brown was the last known U.S. Navy veteran of the First World War. He passed away March 29, 2007, at the age of 105. During the Second World War, the Navy was three million strong, and tattoo parlors were a common sight along the East and West Coasts, particularly in port towns. Meanwhile, advertisements from major companies such as Coca-Cola and Marlboro reflected the times. Fast forward to 1982 and the release of the movie An Officer and a Gentleman. In the opening scene of the movie, the central character, Zach Mayo, is telling his father, a retired Navy enlisted man, that he's going to go to officer training. He's going to be a naval aviator. <laughs> Christ, look at yourself. His father points to his tattoo and says, Officers don't have tattoos. Which is generally true. But the subtle message that his father was telling is that you're trying to be something that you're not. We get this mail. Subic face, Philippines, sir. Ah, gotta recognize the word. In the end, Zach Mayo achieves his dream. Congratulations, Ensign Mayo. In a time when more Americans have tattoos than ever before, it's not surprising the military services would be affected, though they all agree tattoos must never be extremist, indecent, sexist, or racist in nature. Each service has a different take on what is acceptable.